So I, I actually, I brought up a definition of biofeedback because I actually think this is a very concise description of biofeedback. And this is actually, there's an association for applied psychophysiology and biofeedback. They're, they're really like the main entity that, you know, gives education on biofeedback. And so their definition for biofeedback is that it's a process that enables an individual to learn how to change physiological activity for the purposes of improving health and performance. So I, I can break that down a little bit further, sort of how it works, right? right. So biofeedback uses different types of input, like instruments that precisely measure physiological functions. Some of them you might be very familiar with from you know, healthcare or just medical research. Those things can be things like measuring heart rate, with an EKG or you know, brain waves with an EEG, but it, it allows us to gain insight and to visualize our, our physiological functions. So it actually presents that to the person who's using biofeedback. And, and again, that could be any modality. It could be brain waves, heart function, breathing, muscle activity, skin temperature. And so you're presented with that information visually, sometimes with sound as well. And then depending on what outcome you would like to achieve with biofeedback, you learn different techniques and you can see how those techniques are actually affecting your physiology. So you could be working on changing your breathing patterns or changing the way your muscle tension works in reaction to stress or, you know, your thoughts and emotions. And then you can actually see how that's affecting your physiology and gain information on what's working and what's not working to optimize your physiological function. And then you can learn to adjust those over time and then receive the feedback again. And the idea is that over time, you would learn to regulate those functions without the need for the equipment. Right, that makes total sense. Which you, one of the questions we had was, was asking if biofeedback is just really another form of meditation. How would you differentiate between the two? That is such a wonderful question because biofeedback is, a, you can actually use biofeedback with meditation. So biofeedback is both the equipment and the process of receiving feedback from the equipment and then adjusting what you're doing in real time to that feedback. So anything that you're learning in biofeedback for the most part you could probably do without biofeedback right like meditation breathing techniques progressive muscle relaxation i mean obviously our breath is freely available to us anytime and we can learn techniques to alter our breathing that in turn changes the way our autonomic nervous system responds to stress what biofeedback does is it actually gives us feedback on how that's impacting our physiology. So if you're meditating, it might feel good in the moment. It, it may not. That's often not even the point of meditation. But you, you might not know really what effect it's having on you. So biofeedback would allow you to see what impact that meditation is having on your physiology. And then you could actually learn how to meditate better or what techniques of meditation work best for you. So it's not really the biofeedback that's driving the change. It's whatever technique you're using. The biofeedback just accelerates the learning process for you and makes it easier for you to understand what it's doing for you and, right. and make any necessary changes along right. the way. That makes a lot of sense. You know, personally, you know, I have a hard time with meditation. I know that a lot of people do. I get distracted. I fall asleep or, you know, <laughs> all sorts of other things, right? Well, but, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, what? so the, you bring up a really good point, actually. So biofeedback also can gamify things and make it more interesting. In fact, some of the way it can be presented, and I'll actually show you some of this a little bit later, can, I mean, you can just get the physiological data, but you can also 
it can turn the physiological data into games. So it, it sort of becomes almost like a video game, except at the same time, you're training your physiology in a healthier direction as well. I, I think right. it's very cool. It is very cool, you know, and, and for, for those of you out there who are like me, who have a hard time with meditation, you know, don't, don't feel guilty about it. It's okay, we're all different. I like the gamified version of biofeedback, which um, Carrie's gonna share with us a little bit later. I'm very activity driven. And so I am fascinated by the fact that I can kind of play this kind of quasi video game uh, by by my heart rate variability and my breathing technique. And yeah. it's just to me, it's just fascinating. So before we get on to another question, which is going to be the scientific ev evidence, can you share with us a little bit about what a uh, heart rate variability? Am I using the correct term? Um, yeah. it, what, what that's all about? Because that's like big for biofeedback, right? It is. So. It has become one very popular modality. I, so one other thing I'll just briefly say about meditation. I mean, there, there are many types of meditation, but often in meditation, particularly mindfulness meditations, we're actually not trying to obtain any particular like state or turn off thoughts. That's not really like an achievement per se. We're just actually just trying to be aware of what's ever going on in the moment, non-judgmentally. But actually that shows a very specific physiological response as well. So again, we can still get feedback from it, but it's maybe like a less achievement oriented, if that makes sense. But you can still gamify that, that response as right. well. And so, you know, with biofeedback, again, there's like many different modalities. You could measure brain waves and learn to alter brain waves. And sometimes that's really effective, say with children with ADHD, things of that nature. There's like protocols for that people can learn and, and do most, mostly with like a bio feedback therapist who would bring something someone through that there's you know emg biofeedback electromyography where you're learning about your muscle tension and learning to relax it so there's skin conductance which you know is measuring sweat gland activity and you know that obviously as you know changes in response to sweat you know to stress so there's there's all these different things that you can measure and, and sometimes you're measuring multiple modalities it, it just depends on what you're working on who you're working with and like what the goal is in the protocol heart rate variability you know i'll have to over like kind of oversimplify it a little bit because it, it's kind of like a complicated <laughs> kind of a complicated topic, but one way to look at it is it's actually the interval between heartbeats, right? So you have successive heartbeats. If you think of like an EKG, you've probably seen like the heartbeats. It's actually the space between the heartbeats. And that actually varies, right? Like not, not so much as like an arrhythmia or something like that, but it has like natural variation. And, and what this actually shows it's actually a measure of autonomic nervous system balance. You, you actually want some variability because that shows your body's ability to respond to stressors quickly and resiliently, right? And, and to bounce back from those stressors. And again, this is like quite a bit of a oversimplification, but seeing the variability between heartbeats really shows the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system. You know, the sympathetic nervous system, it's, it's known as like fight or flight, right? It's like that physiological response you have to stress, right? Like your heartbeat is faster, your sweat, you know, activity, uh, all, all those things that we know that we respond to from stress. It, it's natural, it's adaptive, it's like what our, our body is meant to do to prepare us to respond to a threat. Normally what would happen is the threat is over, we've survived and our body will calm ourselves down because there's no longer a threat. And this is the other branch of our autonomic nervous system, which is the parasympathetic nervous system. That's otherwise known as rest and digest sometimes. So you have fight or flight, sympathetic, rest and digest, parasympathetic. So that takes over and sort of slows everything down, brings us back to our baseline pre-threat. So heart rate variability, it's one way to measure the healthy balance of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system activity. And so, you know, for a lot of us with chronic conditions or someone who's just dealt with a lot of chronic stress, 
there can often become, and it's not permanent, but a bit of an imbalance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the autonomic nervous system, such that our sympathetic nervous system is like very reactive. And, and again, this is adaptive in a way, because if we've had a lot of pain, you know, we're on alert. When am I going to have a threat again? When am I going to be in pain? So we had like that overreactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. And conversely, our parasympathetic nervous system doesn't always put on the brakes as well. So learning techniques and such as breathing, meditation, progressive muscle relaxation, mindfulness practices. They're, they're all ways to activate our parasympathetic nervous system and to train our parasympathetic nervous system to build back parasympathetic tone, to restore healthy balance between the branches of the autonomic nervous system. So heart rate variability is one way to measure that. You can actually see like how your nervous system is responding in real time and, and learn techniques to balance that more effectively right absolutely you know and i think one of the things that i find really helpful about the heart rate variability we'll just call it hrv just to kind of shorten it um is that that's that's personal for each individual person so i always wondered why you know if i was doing like a group meditation with people if they want to do like the square type of breathing in and out breathe in for three hold for three out for three pause for three that doesn't work for me it's it's really hard and actually you know for me it, it exacerbates my asthma it's not relaxing or just a regular meditation they're doing it at a different speed so with biofeedback you can actually find that your own hrv um that actually helps you relax the most and so that again for me was really fascinating let's talk a little bit about the scientific evidence because I know from my personal experience, it doesn't help with the pain of migraine. But one of the things that we talk about a lot um, uh, with migraine is all the physical symptoms. We don't talk a lot about the psychological impact, the emotional impact, the stress, the anxiety. So that's just for me personally, it helps calm my anxiety, calm my stress. Um, but I know that you know maybe there is some evidence that it may help with pain as well. So let's talk a, a little bit about that scientific evidence that we have as it pertains to migraine. Yeah, I, I think you bring up a lot of really good points. And I, I want to talk about some of the evidence and then unpack that a little bit, right? Like what's driving some of those changes and sort of like a perspective on how to look at that. Um, so there are like a lot of studies over the years looking at headache, looking at migraine and biofeedback. And so like, again, I, I brought up some of this and was looking at this in the last few days. And I, I found really, really great information from the American Migraine Foundation, actually. And what they said is, so biofeedback and progressive muscle relaxation, which is which is one technique you can use with biofeedback or or alone, that these are actually the two most widely accepted non-drug techniques for headache and migraine prevention and treatment. So their effectiveness has actually been demonstrated now across 25 years of research and actually over 100 investigations. So this is not like something new, right? And so looking across studies, biofeedback and relaxation typically yield a 45 to 60% reduction in headache frequency and severity. So I must mention that this evidence is for episodic migraine, so not for chronic. So I think that's one thing to mention. There's less hard data on the efficacy with chronic migraine. That being said, it there's a lot of anecdotal evidence and can certainly be helpful, but I just want to make really certain it's understood that these this, these high percentages are for episodic migraine. So, but you know, this is actually like equivalent reduction in headache achieved by like many headache medications and without potential negative side effects from medication. So, but I think it's really important to know that for many people, if not most, actually, it's actually the combination of drug and not drug treatments right. that yield the most significant improvement. And this is really borne out in like study after study. So again, the average improvement with medication and bio or, or biofeedback alone, like either one of them, 
and, and again, there's a lot of individual variability, but we're talking about like averages is a 55% reduction in migraine. And, and again, this is for episodic migraine. Right. Let's just be like very clear about that. But the combination of medication with biofeedback actually yields an average improvement of 70% reduction in migraine. So for most people, it's actually, and, and again, like most, it's actually the combination of right non-drug and drug interventions that actually yields the best result. And, and I think one way to put this in a perspective is that biofeedback is not a treatment. It's actually a training. Right. So it's not like, you know, if you take a medication, that's a treatment, right? You basically just have to take the medication and it'll do its thing. With biofeedback, it's a training. So you're actually learning to alter your own physiology. And this can be like incredibly empowering. I think it's an amazingly empowering thing for someone with chronic condition to know that they can actually do something that helps move their physiology in a healthier direction. It does not directly reduce or like cure or in any way the effect of migraine or headache. It's not a direct treatment in that sense. And, you know, Shoshana had brought up the really important point that she uses it for stress, anxiety, things of that nature. So one way to look at biofeedback is through the lens of threshold theory. Right. And so, you know, when you're talking about threshold, in most cases, it's really medication that's going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting in raising your threshold. But then something like biofeedback can actually work on your stress response and help you to learn a healthier physiological response to stress. Remember to bring back that healthier balance of autonomic nervous system function. So to the extent that I, I know like our medical director, Dr. Burke, always says that stress is the universal trigger. And, and again, stress, like, let's be clear, stress does not cause headaches, stress right. does not cause migraine. But, you know, to the extent that stress is present in all of our lives, and to the extent that it does affect us physiologically, psychophysiologically, it's in the mix somewhere. So the extent that we can learn a healthier physiological response to stress, that's going to be something else that's going to raise our threshold and, and act as a buffer and help with symptom management. But it, again, it's a training. It's not a direct treatment such as a medication. So I, I think it's just like an important thing to understand about it. Yeah, no, and, and and I love what you're saying about that. You know, I always give a little bit of pushback to Dr. Burke about the stress just because, you know, the times I've gone through a lot of stress, it hasn't seemed to impact my migraine, but right now there's a huge amount of stress in the world for a lot of people. And I've definitely seen an uptick in my migraine attacks. Uh, so I have to kind of swallow my words from the past, you know, but I guess that's I where this helps because it lowers your threshold, lowers your stress. And by that can also help manage your migraine as a tool, right? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a tool. And you know, I, I think that again, with, with stress and, Migraine, again, it's not the stress that's causing the migraine or the migraine attack, right? Again, it's a contributing factor, one amongst many contributing factors. You know, the idea of threshold theory is it's not just right. like one trigger, it's this combination of yeah, potentially exactly. exacerbating yeah, factors. So, you know, again, we, we all do you know, there's a difference between stressors and our stress response. A stressor is anything in our environment externally or internally that we find threatening in some way. And then stress is our psychophysiological response to that. And again, that's what biofeedback is working on is our stress response, not responsible for your migraine attack. <laughs> It's just not like you're not wrong about that, but it is it is a potentially exacerbating factor or trigger. And to the extent that you can mitigate that, you can further raise your threshold, which will help you with your overall symptoms. But it's not going to be the thing that's like the direct treatment. Right. Right. It's almost like an adjunct to your your medical treatment in a way. Right. Absolutely. And I think that it's really important to note that. And thank you for pointing out that 
you know, the studies are predominantly for episodic migraine. You know, I have chronic migraine. So I, I know for a fact that it reduces my stress. I also know and my anxiety levels. They also know that when I don't do it regularly, then the anxiety and the stress come right back. So it's kind of not a once and done. Um, and somebody actually asked a, a live question here. Actually, it was a question we already had, but they asked again, you know, how long does it take before you see results? And before you answer that, I just wanted to say that when I first started biofeedback, that it was very challenging for me. Um, but now, even if I take a break, it's easy for me to slip straight back into it and it seems to have an impact quicker. But let's just, you know, talk, maybe you could talk just for a couple of minutes about that. You know, how long does it take you to actually be able to get adjusted to biofeedback? Like if you're doing the games to actually see if the game works, right? As opposed to drive you crazy because they don't. And then how long does it actually take to have any kind of impact on your threshold for migraine? That makes sense. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good question. I, I think that there is a lot of individual variability, I think. You know, people are coming in with all kinds of different backgrounds, different experiences, different symptoms, different diagnoses, right? Even within like the general category of migraine. So there is a lot of individual variability. And again, because it's a training, not a treatment, you know, there, there is somewhat of a learning curve, but it's not like that difficult. Like any anyone can learn it, but it does take a little bit of time and practice. And, and again, because it's a training, you can think of it as like lifting weights. It wouldn't, just like Shoshana said, it wouldn't be a once and done. You know, the more you lifted it over a period of time consistently, the stronger that muscle would get. You know, so there, there is sort of a dose response curve in a sense of like the more frequently, the more consistently, the more regularly you do it and the longer time period goes by that you're doing it, the more you're going to train that mind body connection. Right. right. I kind of see it a little bit like riding a bike, like it takes you a little bit to learn how to ride a bike. You know, but then if once you've learned, you've learned now, you may not use it for a few years and you, you may stumble a bit when you get back on, but you already knew it. If that makes sense. Yeah. You've got a kind yeah. of a learning curve a little bit. Yeah. And, and one way to think about it is like just take away the biofeedback mm -hmm. for a second and think about learning to meditate or learning a new breathing technique. Like if you've learned something like box breathing. Mm -hmm. Right. or you know progressive muscle relaxation none of these are like that complex or that difficult to learn so the biofeedback actually helps you learn those things faster and helps you know if you're receiving benefit from them and make any tweaks along the way so you know it's just again it's a learning process so all that being said Again, I, I was looking at the research. If you were to go into a clinician's office or participate in a research study where you're using like large scale biofeedback equipment, generally they say that the training acquisitions you would learn in like eight to 10 sessions. And these are generally like, you know, 45 minute or an hour session. Um, you know, again, learning can be measured in many different ways. But that would sort of be like the skill acquisition where you're able to do some of this without receiving the feedback. And, and then again, I think it's like, in a way, once you start to have that training effect, then maybe you need a booster shot every once in a while <laughs> would be the analogy, you know, so Sorry. you would come back to it. However, we do know that any of these techniques, like breathing techniques, meditation, progressive muscle relaxation, the more consistently we can integrate them into our day-to-day -day routine as a long-term practice, the more beneficial they will be over time. So, you know, again, you don't necessarily have to do it like daily for the rest of your life, but the more consistently you can do some of these things and integrate it within your daily life, the, the more benefit that you will have. But, you know, there is a ton of individual variability within that as well. That makes a lot of sense. Um, we have a lot more questions to get through because we have um, some qu live questions coming in here right now. One person asked, why well, should we have a comment? First of all, it, uh, this person says that it helps them feel like they have control over their pain rather than their pain managing them. And I think I, I would mm -hmm. reiterate that, that, you know, it doesn't really give me a huge amount of control over pain, but it gives me some. It makes me, it's empowering because I feel like every little bit that I can control, that I can manage, is very, very empowering. And we all, everybody who lives with migraine 
or any kind of chronic disease needs to feel empowered rather than having their, their disease or their pain manage them. So just going to reiterate that. Uh, one person here asked, you know, how do you know if biofeedback is working? So what would be your quick answer to that? I mean, actually, there's a great way to know, right? So the first couple times you use it, you're actually establishing a baseline. Because remember, you're actually measuring your physiology. Right. So you can see those changes over time and most every device, like you can record the session. So it'll give you graphs and you can see your progress over time. Now, again, what you're seeing is your progress with learning that particular technique and how it's benefiting your physiology. And so that might be indicative of how you're managing stress physiologically. And I think that how much that transfers into symptom management. Again, it may not have direct effects. You have to look at it in terms of like what else is going on, like how else you're right. managing migraine, what medications you're on. But you actually can see how your training is progressing over time within that biofeedback technique that you're learning, which is why it's wonderful, you know, to do it with that feedback because you can see that change right. over time. That's why I like the games part of it because I can actually see you know what I'm doing and when I first started yeah. and I was like I just can't do it I just can't do it and then all of a sudden I was able to slowly start doing it I would also say that you know with like with anything migraine we tend to forget how bad it was even if we get better so what I noticed is that I was feeling pretty good when I was doing biofeedback almost every day and then I stopped for a while and I really noticed a trend down. Now we all know that migraine varies like you just spoke about, but I think that's also indicative. If you do it and you're feeling good, you stop and you start feeling bad, you know, that's kind of indicative that it's helping you. Again, like Kerry says, this is not a cure. It's not a direct treatment in itself. It's just part of a toolbox. It's one of the tools that you can use. So we've had a lot of questions come in uh, about you know, what the, what kind of equipment we can use? How, how do you learn yeah. to do it? So let's jump to that question. You know, what equipment is needed for biofeedback? Because you can do it at home, right? You don't yeah. have to go into a practitioner okay. to do it. All right. So traditionally with biofeedback, you would, you would go into a clinician's office. They would hook you up to like expensive medical grade equipment, right? That would measure all these physiological functions. And you know, again, like we're talking maybe like eight to 10, like hour, 45 minute hour treatments, depending. And so that's not covered by insurance, right? In almost every case, like there might be some types of like pelvic floor biofeedback for certain conditions that may, may be covered, but like the type of biofeedback you would mostly be doing for something like migraine, you're just not gonna have insurance coverage for that. You know, so there is the expense and the time factor, um, you know, with that type of biofeedback. And it can be like hugely beneficial. And there are wonderful practicing biofeedback therapists. You can go in their office and they'll hook you up to like really expensive, high grade medical equipment that's very precise. And they'll teach you everything and they'll show you what to practice at home. And, and for some people, that can be a wonderful way to go. But, you know, again, you're not going to get the insurance coverage there. Over, like in more recent times, there's been this explosion, this advent of inexpensive or relatively inexpensive home biofeedback devices. They vary in quality, right? There's a lot of companies producing home biofeedback equipment. There, there's some that are kind of more known entities. They've been around for a while. They've been used in research. They're used in hospital systems. So, you know, like at NeuroHealth or me personally, like we don't have any like business relationship with any of these companies. But I, I will say that the, a wonderful system for home use is a system called HeartMap. And the reason it, it works with heart rate variability biofeedback, which we were talking about earlier and Shoshana brought up. So it's relatively inexpensive, you know, depending on which device you get, you're talking, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of like $200, 250 again, depending on the device, which that is an expense. But again, we're talking about relative expense. I don't know at this point what in-person biofeedback practitioners are charging, but it could certainly be that much per hour potentially. So, you know, this is a device that you're using at home. 
And so, again, just heart math is a really good one. They've been used in decades of research now, and they're, they're used in a lot of medical practices and hospital systems. So I think there, there's a lot we know about them. It's relatively easy to use and learn and has a very good user experience. So you can you can do it at home with relatively inexpensive devices. You can do it at home on your own. So you can buy a device from a company like HeartMath. They have instructional videos, they have booklets, they have like, like an endless amount of educational material that you can learn to do it. You can also, HeartMath certifies people to do biofeedback protocols using their equipment. So there's HeartMath certified practitioners out there. They have a directory on their website. I, I know some people are asking like how you find a you know qualified biofeedback practitioner. So like HeartMath kind of has their own ecosystem. There's also the biofeedback certifying, I think it's, it's BCIA, I think that stands for um, biofeedback Certification International Alliance or something like that. It's Biofeedback Certification Alliance. It's bcia.org. They, they also have a certification exam. Most of the practitioners using, like certified in that are using, not always, but using like more like um, bigger, like more medical grade um, equipment. I, I mean, HeartMath has like pretty good precision, even in comparison to some of the medical grade advice, you know, devices on research, certainly enough that you can get efficient feedback from it and learn what you need to learn. So yeah, you can definitely do it at home with or without someone helping you to do it. That's, that's good. And I appreciate that. For those who are wondering, I'm just putting a link to HeartMath into, uh, into the comments. So you, you have that there. Um, and I was just going to say a quick caveat to the insurance. Sometimes if as part of an overall program that may be covered by insurance. And I say that because two times I've had it covered for me. Once was when I was admitted to Michigan Head and Neurological Institute and they utilized it. So it was included as part of my inpatient treatment. Uh, and the other time was actually when I was part of a chronic pain program locally mm -hmm. that was outpatient. And they, my insurance covered that. Now we had to do an appeal to even get me into the program, but just for those of you, of you who are interested, that may be kind of a backdoor way in to get it covered. And you know, once you've had a few sessions, that may be enough to kind of get you up and running so you can work on it yourself and, and get a hot math um, device or something like that. But Kerry, I know that, that you are able to share your screen and show us a little bit uh, what that actually looks like. Sure. So why don't we go to sure. that? Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I, I use heart math personally. Um, you know, I, I do have a chronic condition and, you know, it's something that's benefited me a lot. I, I, I use it regularly at home myself and, you know, the device is pretty simple. Like this is what you would get out of the package and this hooks into your cell phone and you would just hook the ear clip on and you would actually get the data from your physiology like right on your cell phone. I also have a device that's hooked up to my laptop as well. It's a little less portable, but it's it's pretty small as well. You just have to hook it into a computer. And so this, the, the um, one that goes into your cell phone is called the inner balance. And then the one that hooks into your computer, it just has like a few more different functions. It's called the EM Wave or the EM Wave Pro is another version of it. Uh, again, I, I'm not trying to sell anyone anything. I don't have any like financial relationship with HeartMath. I just, again, I, I'm talking from my personal experience as well using it. Um, so again, it, it hooks into just right on your earlobe. It's very simple. And it's actually measuring the amount of blood flow through your earlobe, believe it or not. And from that, it's extrapolating your heart rate and then your heart rate variability. And I can just fire that up right now and share my screen and show you what that would actually look like wow. in practice. So right now it's calibrating and can everyone see that okay? Can you see that, Shoshana? Yep. yep. Yeah, so so what you're what you're actually seeing now is my EKG, just like you would see like when you go into a doctor's office or in a hospital. And so that's the squiggly line going across. And now that it's turned to colors, what you're actually seeing, so HeartMath has sort of their own calculations 
they call it a coherent score. And, and basically what it is, is just showing the balance again between your, and, and this is another oversimplification, but you can think of it as showing the balance between your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And another way to look at it is sort of the connection between your heart and your mind, you know, your emotions and your physiology, your response to stress and your physiology, that they're coherent and well-regulated. So this will change like how coherent you are moment to moment, like every single day, right? It's like changing. So if it's in the level, and, and this is gonna be off because I'm talking, right? So there's gonna right. be artifact, there's gonna be movement artifact just from me moving my hands and talking. So it's not like really precise in when you're moving because normally I wouldn't be talking while I'm doing it. But what you're seeing is if it's in the green, then it's a high level of coherence. Red is a low level of coherence. Again, autonomic nervous system balance and like the blue is in between. So the goal would be to get into the green and stay in the green. And the way you do that is by learning different techniques. And HeartMath has, again, a whole ecosystem of techniques. This can be everything from techniques to relax your body and mind but also techniques to proactively produce positive emotions, which we know have a beneficial effect on our nervous system, our immune system. So these are all evidence-based techniques that you learn to move this in a healthier direction. But I can also, this is just like the readout of the data, and you can certainly use this with, you know, to do your biofeedback. You would do whatever technique you're learning and you would get the feedback and you would learn to adjust it depending on where you are, how much in the green you are versus the red. But another thing you can do, and I have to stop it for a minute to get into this other screen, there are a lot of different games that HeartMath has. So this one's like a mandala, this is a coherence coach, it's like a breathing pacer. Um, there's the balloon game, there's like all these different games. I think a fun one is the balloon game. And again, it's just calibrating. Yeah, that's one of the games that I use, which is, it's, it's, it is fun and it's kind of very action oriented for those people who like that. So this one, the more coherent you are, the balloon rises and the less coherent you are, it'll, it'll start to fall. So it's just another way to visualize it. Um, but again, there's all different types of games. And it's really just taking that data and putting it in a different visual form. I don't know, for some reason, I just seem to be very coherent, even though I'm talking and maybe I'm just enjoying being with everyone today. <laughs> um, I could try to make myself like really angry or something and like make the balloon fall, but I don't wanna do that. <laughs> but yeah, you can get the general idea. There's all different ways to visualize it and to play games. And, you know, it does often feel good in the moment when you are doing it and you make that connection you're doing right and it can be you know wonderful way to reduce stress within the moment but you know learning it and training it over time can actually alter your physiology and your physiological response over time and that's when the real benefits come in long term oh see i'm talking it's, it's coming starting, down it's starting it's starting to fall so but yeah, so, you know, it's a really fun way to gamify it. And you're basically paying a video game with your physiology. So okay. I can stop sharing. That was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. There's another one sure. that, um, that you didn't share, but it was on that screen uh, of a garden that starts out black and white. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you get into more coherence, it becomes colored. And that's my, that's yeah. the other one that I really uh, love doing. But, you know, again, it's, it's a little bit of a learning curve, but Personally, I find I do find it helpful. For some people, we know that amount of money is just not going to be accessible. But you know, for others, you know, it, it it is. And if you look at it in terms of you know, if you're spending money on on coffee, you know, the or eating out, then you know, don't eat out for a month, and and maybe that will that will cover the cost. Maybe you don't eat out, but it's a copay for a medication. I, um, I think another. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. To, I'm I'm sorry to cut you off, Shoshana. It just you know one one way to think about it too, like truly. I obviously, I, I really love biofeedback and it's been really beneficial for me. And I think it's 
you know, the, the evidence for it's very intriguing. But I just want to make it really clear again, you don't need it to benefit from the techniques, right? Like I encourage people to learn techniques that help them to regulate their physiology, you know, different breathing techniques, different relaxation techniques, different mindfulness practices. All of these are freely available for you just using your mind and your body. Uh, again, the biofeedback is helping you with the learning process and enabling you to understand how it's impacting your physiology. But it's not strictly necessary, but it is in incredibly helpful. No, absolutely. And I would just say that, you know, so I since I know you know, how slow or how fast to breathe. I know what my HRV is. You know, sometimes I'm sitting in the car and I'm stressed. I'm like, I just yeah, slip yeah. straight into that. So it's like, once you know, you know, if that makes sense, it's, it's just a technique. For me, I found the software helpful. Other people may not. It's just totally optional for those people who just want to add another tool in. You know, the link we shared is not an affiliate link. Uh, neither Kerry nor our organization gets anything from it. It's just yeah. one one of the more reputable places to to get the software yes. that that may help. Um, so one of the questions we have here, and I think we probably kind of answered it, but I'm just going to ask it again: Is is this a practice that only works if you are consistent? Can you ever stop? It, it's a really good question. So just again to go back to this idea that it's a training not a treatment. You know, if you think about anything you've learned, right, um, you, you do, it takes time, you go through the process of learning, and then you do get to a point where you don't have to think about it, right? You, I, I, I always butcher the phases, but the phases are something like unconscious incompetence. It's like you don't know what you don't know. And then conscious incompetence, you start to know what you don't know. And then it becomes conscious competence where you're able to do it, but you have to like think about doing it. And then it goes to unconscious competence where you just do it more automatically. If you think about learning to drive a car, when you started, if you learned to drive a car, you were like, I don't like you had to think about anything. Like if someone cut you off in traffic, it would be bad because like you don't have the motor learning to respond to it. Now you drive, you probably get somewhere. You're like, how, how did I even get here? Like, I didn't even think about driving. It's become, you become unconsciously competent. So again, like the ultimate goal of biofeedback is that you would gain this training. Like you would learn how to just on, more automatically alter your physiology in a more healthier direction that your response to stress would be, you know, you would handle stress better, you would be more resilient to stress physiologically, psychophysiologically. That said, again, remember what I talked about, A, about the booster shot. So, you know, you kind of, like, if you don't do something, it's sort of like you become rusty, right? Like anything. If someone was like really good at golf and they didn't play for a year, they'd probably have to work back up to it. It's like anything else. So again, like if you wanted to stay like really sharp, you would have like a regular practice and there's benefit anytime you do one of these techniques like breathing, mindfulness, it literally has beneficial impact on you. So to the extent that you keep doing it, it's gonna keep benefiting you. But over time you do learn to do it more automatically because you, you've learned. Yeah, and, and it makes you more aware. I know that I'm more aware if I'm yes. breathing fast or if my pulse is racing, it's like I've just become more aware of what it means for me physiologically to be calm as opposed to not calm. Yeah, that, that's actually definitely part of what you're learning is you're building awareness. So you think about it, autonomic nervous system actually means like automatic, right? You don't have to like consciously breathe, right? Like if you, for, you can't forget to breathe and then like not breathe, right? But you're learning to consciously regulate those functions. So you are becoming more aware of how your physiology works. And to that extent that you have awareness, then you can start to make changes. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, one final question that we have, and that sure. is, you know, are, are there any medical conditions that would mean that you cannot use or should not use biofeedback? What I would say is that Anytime you start something like biofeedback, you should definitely run it by your physician. 
So I don't know offhand of any particular medical condition, but I'm certain I'm not a physician. I'm also not aware of every medical condition out there. So I think it's just really important if you're starting something like this to, in general, it doesn't have side effects, it's not dangerous, but I, I would definitely, definitely say that you should 100% run it by your doctor and just get their input so you know that it's safe for you. I think, you know, it's really individual. I, I Someone did bring up the issue of like skin conditions. And one thing I'll say about that is some of the biofeedback devices, especially like, you know, the larger ones that you would use, like more medical grade, you know, some of the sensors or the gels that they use can sometimes be irritating to people. Right. Um, I, I don't think for most people, you know, these clips are that you're, however, I have met people who have certain sensitivities, right? Like skin sensitivities yeah. or ner like nerve sensitivities. So, so for some people, it is true that even the little bit of pressure on their right. earlobe, you, you know, there are different people who have different conditions that that can be like really irritating or exacerbating. Heart math and other systems have other ways to use it. There are finger sensors, right. you know. So I would say, as a general rule, you should always run something like this by your doctor. If you have something that you know you have certain sensitivities, either skin or nerve sensitivities, then you would definitely want to run it by your doctor. And then if you were moving forward with biofeedback, I think that would be a case where working with a qualified certified biofeedback therapist would be the way to go because they can make those adjustments for you and make it work for you. Absolutely. And, and just to clarify for people that the heart math systems, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they don't have any kind of gel or sticky. It's not adhesive. No. Uh, I'm one of those people that reacts to anything that has any kind of glue adhesive in. Do not react to this. Uh, but you're also not leaving it on for that long. It's not like you're wearing it for hours and hours at a time or a day at a time. It's it's just a short uh, thing. That's not to say someone may not want something clipped to their ear, you know, but you can also get a finger sensor as well. So, you know, there are yeah. options that go around it. Um, so I just want to, you know, kind of sum it up that this is a tool in your toolbox. So we talk about a toolbox a lot um, that, you know, you can have medical devices, medications, lifestyle changes, and alternative treatment options. And biofeedback is one of those treatment options that it's great to add into your toolbox. If you're really well controlled, you may not need it. But we know that over 50% of the people in our community have chronic migraines. So we know that it's not that well controlled. So this may be something that is just worth considering worthwhile looking into and we're open to any questions and comments about that. So just want to say thank you so much everybody for joining us today. This is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel before the end of the day. I hope that you have found this helpful. If you have questions that have not been answered, please put them in the comments. And I hope I'm okay in saying this, Carrie, but I'll just, if there are any questions, I'll just shoot you an email um, and just make sure of I'm course. answering it correctly. Thank you. Um, I, I'm, ha I'm happy to help in any way I can. Thanks. And I, I really appreciate you having me. This was a lot of fun. And I, I think you have a wonderful group as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, we know that migraine is so challenging. Uh, and so again, just to reiterate what Carrie says, we encourage you to proactively partner with your doctor Explore different options, create an action plan, plan that works best for you to manage your pain and other symptoms. And again, if you haven't already explored NeuroHealth, you want a second opinion, or you're just looking for a certified headache doctor, then we encourage you to check out NeuroHealth. So again, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope you all have a great day. Bye-bye.